Ravel's Minuet in G major is a great example of reimagined classical tradition. It is the fifth out of six movements of a suite called Le Tombeau de Couperin, which was composed between 1914 and 1917. The whole opus is based on the Baroque suite form. During World War I, Ravel was a truck driver for the French troops. Each movement of the suite is dedicated to a friend who died in battle. This one to Jean Dreyfus. Le Tombeau de Couperin was originally written for solo piano, but Ravel also orchestrated four of the movements two years later. Ravel used an ABA structure as the blueprint for this minuet. This form had already made its way into concert music in the early 18th century with the minuet and trio. I was introduced to this minuet in the classical harmony lessons that I took back when I was in my second year of university. I remember the teacher saying that some of the chords sound a lot like jazz, and already back then I wanted to investigate that matter. So here I am, years later, finally doing that. For the extra challenge, I thought it might be nice to record the audio examples for this one myself, which turned out to be a pretty smart decision because playing the piece made me understand it better and it was also a nice way to work on my piano chops. And now enough for the talking. Let's dive into the music. Hello viewers. Welcome to Andy Analysis. Before I start with the analysis, let's listen to the opening 8 bars. Alright, so first a basic overview. The key, as you already know, is G major. The time signature is 3-4 and the tempo indication is Allegro Moderato at quarter note equals 92. We can find a lot of other details and indications on top of that, like phrase markings, legato bows, dynamics, tenutos, staccatos, all of that, indicating very clearly how the piece should be played. Especially the legato bows give each voice a direction, a sense of autonomy and, careful, major spoilers ahead, we now already found one of the main concepts behind this first section, linear writing. Think about it like this. If you come from a pop or jazz background, you will be used to thinking of melody and harmony kind of as two separate things. As you can see, in this example there's basically no real voice leading going on. Instead, we are jumping from one chord to the next. Now, we will hear that jumpy sound in this piece later on as well, but in this first section we are rather dealing with some kind of a choral setting, with multiple melodic lines coming together to form the harmony. So there are basically those four voices, with the fifth one occasionally making an appearance, adding some spice to the mix, if you will. This is a very important info if you were to write an adaption for, say, a chamber ensemble like a wind quintet, or, well, the actual orchestration that Ravel did himself. So, even though there is a very even vertical structure in here as well, with chords moving sort of in blocks from beat to beat, the piece works through its individual voices, meaning said vertical chords are the product of multiple independent horizontal lines working together. By the way, speaking of chords, I think I actually forgot a little something. Ah, much better. Now, looking at all those symbols, we can see there are actually some very interesting chords, like a major 7 here, a minor 7 there, and even two chords with an added ninth. 
So I think it's pretty safe to say, there is actually a lot of jazz going on. Hey, sorry, quick interruption. This is Meta Andy. What's up, everyone? So, it is indeed interesting to see that an analysis with chord symbols works so well here, but using jazz chord symbols as a means of analysis and then pointing out that Ravel was writing very jazzy is actually the very definition of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Even though Ravel was in fact influenced by jazz on his later works, just those few 7th and ninth chords by themselves are not enough to prove that. Four note chords have been around since Bach already and adding a fifth one on top of that might have been a logical, purely classical development. Oh, uh, yes, thank you Meta Andy. That comment was actually very helpful. Indeed, chord symbols suggest that the chords work as standalone colors, which I'd argue to be true to a certain extent in this piece as well, but not entirely. Let's take this chord here that I named C major 7 slash E for instance. Playing it just by itself, yes, we could absolutely say this sounds like a C major 7. However, given that the C is only held for an 8th note and then moves to D, resolving the very dissonant minor 2nd interval in the top voices, to a consonant 3rd, we are actually dealing with a suspension here. Still staying in jazz terms for a little bit, we could now call the chord of the moment E minor 7, but Seeing that the right hand is now playing the same G triad, which is repeated on the third beat, this E minor 7 is actually another suspended color, the suspension being in the bass this time. Next, there is this C at 2, sort of resolving to a G6, which then immediately moves to an A minor 9. The A minor 9, in turn, is both a temporary target as well as another suspension leading to the next chord, B minor 7 slash D, which goes to A minor 7 slash D, resolving to a D7 with an added ninth. So it is a longer passage this time. Two bars of constant tension release, finally landing back home on G major. The slur actually indicates that very clearly. All of these chords belong to the same phrase. So at the core, albeit in a rather extended way, these first eight bars follow principles of classical harmony. The jazz angle is definitely there as well, however, but more in a superimposed way, serving as a coloring tool. There's one more thing that I want to show you before moving on to the next section. Though hidden a little bit by the D pedal tone, there is a 2-5-1 cadence right here. The 251 is of course the backbone of jazz harmony, so it was interesting to me that Ravel used it pretty much as the logo of this minuet. You will hear this cadence and variations of it coming back throughout the piece. Now, to finally build a bridge to the next section. As you probably already noticed, these first 8 bars can be broken down into two 4 bar phrases. The second of them ends in B major. So there's some third relation going on here between G and B. The B part starts in B minor, or Phrygian to be precise. So in a way we are going back again to the G environment. But coming from B major it rather feels like the root B stays the same and the tonality just shifts from major to minor. So this is the B part, and it's in B minor. That fits well, right? Melodically, the B part is a very straightforward development of the A part. It uses the same motivic ideas, but with some variation.
Now for the accompaniment. The left hand is resembling something like a stride piano style now. There is less movement in the middle voices, so the whole section feels a bit more calm. The first half of the B part is built up exclusively of minor chords. In jazz theory, this concept is called constant structure, referring to the fact that the same chord type is used several times in a row. The result of this constant use is that no clear tonal center can be perceived anymore, which means we are in fact dealing with a non-functional approach to harmony. The second half of the B part is easily one of my favorite moments in the whole piece. This F sharp right here should of course again most likely be interpreted as a suspension. However, seeing that it is kept for a dotted quarter note, there is actually an overlap with the E in the bass giving us a full E minor 9 sound for a split second before resolving. The D, however, is not resolved. So in this section we actually do seem to be dealing with 7th chords as our go-to, just like the jazz cats would do it. Even more captivating to me was this sound. This is yet another suspended chord, however a kind of incomplete one in a classical sense. I made a little example to show what I mean. Here's something I thought Bach might have written in this context. All the notes of the first chord are resolving, chromatically or stepwise, to a chord tone of the target chord. In comparison, here's what Ravel wrote. There are two fundamental differences here. One, there is no leading tone in Ravel's version. And two, the 9, the C sharp, doesn't resolve. So, I don't actually hear this as a suspension, in a functional sense, but rather as a melodic movement, an upbeat to the next phrase. The melody now has a much more independent role than it had before. So, for the last bit of the first part. This feels like a closing statement to me, a little summary before the piece moves on. The reason why it has this closing kind of quality is that the opening four bars of the minuet are also the last four bars, just played one octave higher. Those last four bars are preceded by a variation of the same statement, starting one tone higher on E, testing the waters first, sort of taking aim if you will. The harmony supports this idea with this half diminished chord that even has an added ninth, which is a very unstable color, functionally speaking. The formerly mentioned logo of the piece makes an appearance again, but instead of resolving directly, it takes a little detour. This sort of insecure sounding harmony in the first four bars, followed by the very clear statement of the second four bars, results in a classic question and answer structure. Imagine the piece hesitating for a moment, like, oh wait, is this the right way? And then being reassured, oh yeah, definitely, everything was correct after all. Let's keep that in mind and listen to the entire section. Now, let's have a look at what we have so far. There is a first statement of 8 bars, which is repeated. After that, a development of 16 bars, and then a closing or a summary of 8 bars. This total of 24 bars is also repeated. This dialogic writing is one of the many examples in this composition, where the traditional minuet form, even though being the blueprint, is enhanced and thus converted to a serious piece of concert music. We will see more examples of this at a later point. And, speaking of a later point, I think this is a fitting spot to end the first video. If you liked what you saw, make sure to tune in again to see part 2, as soon as it is released, where I will discuss the rest of the piece. Hope to see you all there! Bye!